Lord, Spirit, one God, Amen. May the Lord bestow upon us His blessing, mercy, grace, and wisdom now and ever into the age of ages. Today is the first Sunday of the blessed month of Beba. Um, and as we said last month was the theme of the love of God the Father. And the next few months is uh, the general theme of the grace of His only begotten Son. And this month um, has to do with the grace that, that relates to the power of the Lord. <clears throat> and so today we see the Lord's power over sickness and over sin, <clears throat> over nature, over the devil, and over death. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, here we see the Lord healing the paralyzed man, or the man who is paralytic. Uh, and this, there's more than one, right? There's two main times in the church where we uh, speak of the healing of the paralytic man. Today, the gospel is according to St. Mark chapter 2, and the other one is the gospel according to St. John chapter 5. Today, we're in the city of Capernaum. Um, the other gospel, which we read during the Great Lent, um, is in Bethsaida or Bethesda. Uh, today, the Lord heals the man in the house, right? The other story is at the pool, <clears throat> and so on and so forth. Today, he had friends to bring him. The other guy said, I have no one. <clears throat> so, also we see a similarity of today's gospel and a couple of weeks ago when the Lord uh, went to Zacchaeus' house, both had similar circumstances in which they wanted to go to the Lord, but they couldn't because there was a crowd where there was obstacles in the way. Um, <clears throat> um, one climbed the tree, the other had friends to bring him um, to meet the Lord. <clears throat> so, a lot of us have obstacles for us in our meeting the Lord. Sometimes it has to do with obstacles that we put in, in, uh, before the Lord, whether intentionally or unintentionally. And sometimes it's our sins um, that are preventing us from, or oftentimes sin is what does it the most. And other times it's um, the, the, the work of the evil one. Um, <clears throat> but today we just wanted to focus on the aspect of how do we rise above um, the, the obstacles in our life um, and what do we need to keep in mind um, when things don't necessarily go our way, right? So, um, what are the, there's two main um, symbols that we take these four friends um, to re reflect in, in the life of our, our relationship with God, right? That these four friends help us and bring us to the feet of Christ. We ascend above the problems, we descend to the feet of the Lord, and then we are transcend transcended from this life to the next, or from the, the worldly thoughts to the heavenly. <clears throat> so what do these four friends we've spoken about before? The number four. Um, the first example is the, the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where the gospel or the life of Christ or the words of, of the Lord have the power to not to bring us closer to him and so that's why we read uh, the holy scripture especially the gospels we consider the gospels the crown of scripture right and the words have power <clears throat> um as uh, saint paul says to the thessalonians um for this reason we thank god without ceasing because when you received the word of god which you heard from us you welcomed it not as the word of men but as it is in truth the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe, right? So the word of God has power to work in us as long as we have faith, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, and uh, another author says that these words are not just importing, imparting information, but efficacious power that enters into the world to save and to transform. So the word of God has power to save and to transform. Um, as long as we read it and use it and live according to it with the other group of four friends. So there's another symbol that St. Augustine has a lengthy uh, commentary about it. Um, but anyone have another idea of what these four friends can also symbolize? Not, not the directions um, the directions actually remind us of 
um, the cross because in the Old Testament, as we know, when, when they had the tabernacle, the tabernacle was located in the middle of the children of Israel uh, geographically, and they would encamp and most likely also travel um, from one place to another with the tabernacle in its midst. Um, and the camps wouldn't, um, or the, the Israelites, the 12 tribes, would encamp three, uh, three or so um, uh, tribes in each direction. <clears throat> um, but actually, there's another symbol here that we've mentioned before. So um, I, I won't go into it in, in depth today, but the, ch the church as a whole. So if you consider the three basic ranks of the church, the bishop, the priest, the deacon, right? And then the lay person or the servant, all these four work together to bring to the person, to the feet of the Lord, and to hear him say, your sins are forgiven you, right? <clears throat> As one um, uh, also uh, author says, when my mind gets confused, I become too weak to carry out any good work as if I'm paralyzed. So we are the paralyzed person who feels, I can't, I can't come to you to the Lord today, or I don't feel your presence, or I, I feel weak, right? And he says, then I am in need of the four evangelists to lift me up. So here he uses the, the gospels, right? They bring me to the Lord Christ to hear him say that I am a child of God and my sins are forgiven. Okay, so again, the, the, the church and scripture are, are used by the believer to ascend above the worldly obstacles, to descend to the feet of the Lord, and to be transcended or to be changed or transformed um, in, from the worldly person to a spiritual person or a person of heaven. And, so, and that can't be done, like we said, without the church. The church is the one who actually brought us the scripture itself and teaches us how to use and to understand it. <clears throat> Right. Um, so, um, but oftentimes in our spiritual life, we feel like we're doing well. And then, um, especially in the beginning, we have a, 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 a taste of the grace, right? Things go easy. And then after a while, when we mature spiritually, we fall on our face, right? It's kind of like um, when we learn to ride a bike. Um, and a lot of times when someone wants to describe a task that's easy, either to say the piece of cake or say it's just like riding a bike. But as a child, when I didn't know how to ride a bike, I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> this is a very hard task, right? Um, <clears throat> because once you learn, it's easy. But as you are learning, or if you don't know how, it becomes a, quite an obstacle um, or a form formidable task. So. But the problem is, you know, sometimes we learn on tricycles, right? Or we have training wheels, and it seems very easy. And so we look at the person riding a regular bike, like, that's a piece of cake. I, I can do it. <clears throat> um, and so, but then when the training wheels come off, it's a completely different ballgame, right? Um, it's not as easy as we thought. And many times we find ourselves up one second and on our face uh, the next. <clears throat> so the spiritual life is kind of like this, right? When watching others or hearing about others like the saints, it seems like, yeah, I could do that, it's a piece of cake. Then when we go through the motions, it's it's hard. Um, we're, we're, we know what we need to do, but we're not there yet. And even for the experienced uh, believer, there are difficulties. We have to experience difficulties and taste them um, in this life. Um, <clears throat> but um, uh, the Lord says, you know, okay, now that you have tasted what it kind of seems like with, with training wheels, I need to take you to the next level, right? Um, the new believer is on training wheels, right? Um, but after a while, we have to take them off because it kind of looks funny if there's an adult riding a bike with training wheels, right? Um, so um, we have to learn, right? The Lord says, no, I need to take you from level one to level two. Uh, how do we learn? What's the process of going from, from one level to another with the Lord? Well, first, we have to realize I can't do it alone. I can't just take them off and go. Um, it's not going to work that way, typically, right? We need the friends, 
We need the church. We need the, the, the scripture. Uh, and um, the funny thing is sometimes in the beginning, when you take off and you, the, the, the wheels and you assume it's a piece of cake and then you keep falling, the person might think, well, what's wrong? Um, the person who pushed me off pushed wrong or there's something wrong with the bike or maybe there was a rock in the road. Or you start making excuses. I know how to do this. I don't know what's going on. I, I did one, two, three and the church said do one, two, three and, and I'm, it's not working. What's going on? Um, <clears throat> so we start pointing fingers and oftentimes the Lord says, hold, hold on a second. Um, don't just focus on the results, but realize that there's something that needs to be adjusted, something that needs to be fixed. When you are on training wheels, it didn't matter if, if you kept the handlebar straight um, very much, right? But once you take it off, the slightest change um, will, will cause a big a difference. So um, we need to be more sometimes to, to recognize that okay, maybe this fall is uh, a lesson for me to adjust or to be more careful, or to be more balanced, or to be more straight, to be more orthodox or aligned in, in my thinking or in my lifestyle. <clears throat> um, and so this step um, uh, of the process takes quite a bit of time. We need a lot of practice. We need to go over and over and over, and we need to adjust what um, we were taking for granted when we were in the period of grace. So God gives us a lot of grace a lot of the time, but sometimes he wants to put a pause on the grace so that we grow. It's because if we're always going downhill, then how are we going to learn to pedal? Right? So we, we, God wants us to have difficulties even sometimes or oftentimes in the spiritual life so that we grow from one level uh, to another. <clears throat> and so trying to say, number one, it's okay that we fall, but Number two, we have to learn from the fall. Um, <clears throat> and so um, during the mo when we do the motions, like the, the prayer, the fasting, the reading, the confession, the communion, uh, we don't do it by ourselves, but we need training. And every time we fall, we go back and ask, what did I do wrong? Um, and oftentimes it will be the same advice. You know, just go faster, keep straight, you know, don't worry, right? Um, and the, the church will oftentimes give me the same direction, but um, I need to uh, take it to heart. Um, <clears throat> and sometimes it becomes frustrating because um, everything seems fine for a second, right? Um, but then all of a sudden we're on the ground, right? Um, so we're tempted to fall um, in the early stages by thinking it wasn't our fault or to point fingers towards others or even to God. Um, but it's a sign that, okay, I'm not, I'm not there yet. Um, <clears throat> but the longer we keep at it, the, the, the righteous person will fall seven times and, and get up again, as, as the proverb says, <clears throat> uh, chapter 24. It says, for the righteous man may fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity, right? So we don't fall because of sin or we, well, I mean, I'm saying, the righteous person, when they fall, they repent and grow and learn from the mistake. But but the wicked person doesn't learn, right? <clears throat> um, so um, oftentimes we need to look at the person or uh, the trainer, right? He knows how to ride a bike, right? He understands the strengths and weaknesses of the rider um, who, who is me and knows what I need to learn before um, becoming successful. Um, he also knows when um, and how to let go, right? So usually the person training, uh, training you know, ch their child to, to, to ride a bike, right? Well, I don't know, this is what I used to do. Push them straight <laughs> as much as I can, but not push them until, um, until they kind of seem to have it um, aligned. Um, so they're in the best scenario, right? And you kind of run with them as much as you can until they're fast enough and then you push them off. But what I used to do also is calculate where they're going to fall because I know they're going to fall. 
and make sure they, they fall in like a piece of uh, grass or soft plates. <laughs> Not, so, so God does this with us. He, he, he um, walks with us or runs with us for a period of time. And this says, okay, I need to let go now. And, and I, I know you're going to fall, but I'm going to be there to, to help you soften the blow. Right? <clears throat> um, and so, um, do we want them to fall? No. Do they need to fall? Yes. Right? The Christian needs to fall every now and then, but the, the, but get up and learn from, from your mistakes. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so this is basically the, the aspect of carrying the cross. Every time we have a trial or tribulation or difficulty, we should embrace it knowing that I fell, but I have a lesson to learn, and this is an opportunity for me to grow and to, um, to learn from my mistakes. Um, <clears throat> And so, um, God is not always mad at us when He when He allows us to fall. No, it's 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 a process of, of learning for, for most of us. Sometimes, yes, He He lets us fall on purpose to, to wake us up and and to correct ourselves. But for the person who is honest and faithful and and trying to grow, and it's not necessarily a specific sin that is in the way, um, He uses this as an opportunity. Okay. Um, <clears throat> And so um, there's a difference, like we've said in the past, between um, the sadness um, that results from the worldly life and the sadness that leads to repentance. St. Paul talks about this to the Corinthians um, in, in the second book, because in the first letter he wrote to them and he, he pointed out a lot of the mistakes that they had. And then... A lot of them became sad. So he wrote, um, even if I made you sorry with my letter, I don't regret it. Why, St. Paul, you're making them sad. But then he says, um, <clears throat> said, though it made you sorry only for a while, um, it on you only scraped your knee a little bit, right? But now he says, I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. What did the fall lead to, right? I'm not talking about the fall of Adam and Eve. We know what that led to, right? But but the, my my personal mistake or my personal um, uh, obstacle that that prevents me from feeling and living close to God, that experience um, should help us lead to repentance. Um, <clears throat> he says, "For you were made sorry, sorrow, sorry, you were made sorry in a godly manner." That you, that you might suffer loss from us and nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. This is the point we wanted today. The godly sorrow produces repentance leading salvation, not to be regretted. That's why he says, I don't regret it. He said he re regretted it personally because he had compassion on them. He said, but then he says, I don't regret it, though I did regret it. So as a father, um, he, he felt bad because the child was on the ground, but as a trainer, he didn't feel bad because this is the way to learn, okay? Um, <clears throat> and then he says, but then look, look at what happened to you. He said, what diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication, all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. He says, this created for you to be even more holy and more pure and more zealous um, so, um, this is what we need to learn. See, look, this time you wrote is different than a hundred times ago when you, you fell, you know, after uh, a fraction of a second. Now you lasted three seconds. <laughs> um, you're getting better, right? So, um, <clears throat> it's, it's not just the process, actually, just to clarify, it's not the, just it's the process that brings us closer, but it's not only the process of sin. You know, it could be tribulations or difficulties in our lives where we feel um, God is not there. Um, or when God doesn't do what we want him to do or what we expect him to do. That's another thing. Maybe the problem is well, I just need to change my expectations and say, okay, here's another opportunity for me to grow. Um, <clears throat> it can even refer to the times where we feel distant from him, even though we're going through the motions, the prayer and the reading and all, all of that. Um, but it's okay as long as we get up and we try to learn from them. So, and at the end, 
God willing, we will do it. You know, we look back and see, oh, um, there's no one holding. He's not holding uh, me anymore, um, but he's still with us. He's, he's on the bike with us still. Um, <clears throat> and, and so that, that's why the Lord says, you know, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So the good news is that even if we stop riding for, for years, that's when it's just like riding like that. We can still get back on and uh, continue from where we left off. Um, and so um, that's why, like St. Paul said to, to the Athenians in the book of Acts, he said um, that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not very far from each one of us. Um, God is not far from each one of us, even if in your difficulties. This is sometimes part of the process for us to learn and to grow. We just have to keep at it and to get up and to try again and to learn from our mistakes. May the Lord give us the grace, but even take away the grace sometimes that we may grow in him and be like him. And glory be to God now and to the age of